You are now listening to the Counterflow Podcast, a place for dissonant voices and unapproved opinions. You get split in half, cause I call the hologram wrath, but I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast, rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid and gas. We smash your sinus with the power of Lord Titus, but I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Here is your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson. What's up, you guys? Welcome back once again to the Counterflow Podcast. As always, I am your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson, coming to you out of Lockhart, Texas, the barbecue capital of Texas, which basically makes it the barbecue capital of the world. And yes, Texas, 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 Texas. We are all in the news the past few weeks. I'm sure most of you listening are very familiar with this situation. Our governor has indeed found a spine and is pushing back very publicly and very, I would say, bravely against the federal regime, the Biden administration. And, you know, it almost feels silly to put Biden's name on this because we understand that it's much more or probably almost all something that's not really him, if that makes sense. So the feds came after us and Governor Abbott pushed back and said, absolutely not. So far, the feds have just said, well, okay. And it seems like they've wandered off. Where will this go? What does this mean for the big picture? What does it mean historically in this moment? Is secession in the big picture here? Is the Texas movement something that's coming to fruition? We go over a lot of these things. These are both great, great, brilliant men, Dr. Clark Carlton and my friend Jim Jatris, both friends of this show, both Orthodox Christians and both very well versed in history. The secession movement, we were all at a conference last year that uh, had some of those themes you know, overlapping with orthodoxy. And I think you're going to get a lot out of this. And without further ado, I'll bring them both on right now. Friends of the show, Clark Carlton and Jim Jatris. What an honor to have you both. Welcome to the show, guys. How are y'all? Very good. How how are y'all over there? (laughs) Y'all, I'm doing quite quite well. I'm really doing well that you have uh, Elon Musk's internet because there's been a few glitches in the past when I've had you on. So this ought to flow perfectly. Well, if it doesn't, you can blame him. I, yes, yes. And um, yeah, he's got quite the title from you. He's, he's one of your favorites. Your favorite African-American. You there bet. you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, also, I'd be remiss if I didn't. There's actually going to be an ad for this book. Uh, there was in the last episode. There will be in this episode too. And just for my audience, I, most of, uh, 99% of the time when I do ads, it's people paying me to do them. It's always stuff I believe in. It's not just going to be some, some, something I don't like. But these ads I'm doing for free because Clark Carlton's book that was just reissued is one of the best um, orthodox books I've ever read, to be quite honest. And I'll, I'll preface this for people. I've been in the faith for t- a couple of years. Maybe for someone who's been into it 30 or 40 years, you might go, well, of course, I know all this stuff. But I know a lot of the people listening to this show are either inquirers or are new to the faith. And so I can't recommend it enough. Clark, could you tell them about uh, this book? Sure. Thanks, Buck. And I appreciate the free advertisement, certainly. Um, the, the Life is the, uh, technically, it's the fourth ver- uh, volume in the faith series. Um, the faith uh, being the catechism, catechetical series that was published, uh, oh gosh, beginning in 1997. Um, and, and the volumes have been out of print for a couple of years. And so we got the faith back in print uh, last January. And now uh, the life is, which when you're talking about the Orthodox Doctrine of Salvation is back in print. This is volume four. Now volumes two and three have not been reprinted yet, but hopefully by this summer, um, they need new chapters and uh, a bit more editing than this one did. Uh, But anyway, um, it's the Orthodox uh, Doctrine of Salvation. I tried to make uh, the... um, Topic is as simple as I as I could without without dumbing it down too much and without uh, um, watering it down. Uh, but I appreciate your your kind words and uh, for the book and hopefully uh, people who didn't know it was available will now know. And Amazon is the best spot for this. I think so. Yeah, um, and you can also do it. Should be available through distributors if if bookstores want to do you know bookstores or bulk orders or things like that. Excellent. Yeah, but for individual copies, Amazon is, is either that or bug eighth day books to carry it. Got it. Okay. 
And and I'll get to Jim in just a second. Clark, give uh, you've been on the show before, but the way algorithms work, this could be someone's first time ever seeing your face, seeing my face, seeing Jim's face. Give them a brief intro for yourself, and then we'll get to Jim. Oh gosh, um, well I've been uh, teaching uh, philosophy at the university level for almost thirty years, going on thirty years. Um, became an Orthodox Christian in 1988, I think. I think that's right. Um, graduate of St. Vladimir's uh, Seminary in uh, New York. Um, did my MA and PhD at Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Jim, give an intro for yourself. Well, uh, re regarding books, uh, I, uh, I do have one coming out later this year. My collected writings, my first and only. Uh, book, I, I assume, uh, tentatively entitled, I Tried to Warn You, and uh, just uh, my collected writings. Uh, of course, you, you two newbies here, I mean, I've been in the Orthodox trade for almost 70 years, since 1955, uh, so uh, I, I don't know if that counts for anything. Um, you know, originally from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, from uh, from parents, or grandparents, all four, all four of whom were from Sparta, in Greece, my parents were born here in the United States, raised in a military family. My father was a career fighter pilot, uh, law school at uh, Georgetown University, undergrad at Penn State, um, foreign service officer, the, the diplomatic service for several years, and then working for many years at the U.S. Senate and the Republican leadership staff there. And then I was an evil Washington lobbyist for several years, and now I'm a retired Virginia country gentleman. Wonderful. Well, I, I got you guys both on because I, I didn't even ask you if this is a topic that interests you, but knowing what I do of y'all and, and considering the event we were at this several months ago at this point, it seemed relevant to have y'all both on. My state of Texas, uh, my governor specifically, is for the first time since I've been paying attention to him showing uh, a spine, we'll put it nicely, that I didn't think he had. And he's basically pushing back against the Biden regime on the, the border issue that's going on. And I, I think first I want to get kind of the 3,000 foot view of really what's happening. We don't have to get into to the small minute details yet. I do want to get into that. But uh, Jim, from where you're sitting, wh what does it look like from, from, from your view of what's going on here in Texas with, with Governor Abbott? Well, right now, the case that we're seeing that uh, th that's at the Supreme Court, that 25 governors, Republican governors all, no Democrats, have uh, endorsed Texas's position, essentially amounts to a claim by Texas that um, because the feds have violated the constitutional compact to protect the state from invasion, that Texas can take self-help measures to do that. Um, I can tell you from people I know that know the constitutional thinking of the Supreme Court very well on a personal basis, that that argument is not going to go very far. That, uh, remember, let's even remember at the time of the secession in 1861, that was the argument the seceding states used, that the Union had the, had the feds and the other states had violated the compact between the states. Their understanding was that the Constitution is an agreement, a mutual agreement among sovereign entities. Uh, for war, better or worse, and mostly for worse, that legal theory kind of died in 1865. And, and it really comes down to the question at this point, once Texas has exhausted its uh, remedies through a legal and constitutional system, which in my opinion is, is, is now pretty much a fiction. And I know that will offend a lot of people to say that we no longer live any constitutional rule of law republic, but in my opinion, we don't and haven't for a very long time. Once those uh, those uh, those um, uh, remedies have been exhausted through what purports to be a legal process, is Texas or any other state willing to stand up and defy defy federal law or as it's being enunciated by the federal authorities and face them down? My guess is they probably will not. And so I think a lot of the excitement, both fear and maybe a little giddy optimism that we're approaching some kind of new uh, secession or something of this sort um, 
I think is at, at the very best premature. And, you know, to me, what's going on now is kind of a trash talk before the main event. The main event will be unfolding over the next few years. I think this November will be pivotal. Uh, but, um, you know, buckle up, boys and girls. Uh, it's going to be a rough ride. We ain't seen nothing yet. Clark, I'll let you answer that general topic. Well, first of all, I'm in shock because heretofore, Republican governors have been the second most feckless, spineless, ballless group of people on the planet Earth. And I, I'm, I'm shocked that Abbott has gone this far. And I'm shocked 24 other governors have at least publicly come out. I mean, DeSantis seems to have found his kuhanis now that he's not no longer in his ill-advised run against Trump. Um, and so I'm, I'm just... I'm just, I'm pleasantly surprised, but I'm surprised, like Jim, I don't think, nothing's happened yet. And when, when, when the feds decide to push back, I'm a, I'm, I'm, on, on the one hand, at a certain level, Biden's playing a weak hand, but then of course we've got a non-compass president and a non-existent vice, pre, you know, a non-entity for a vice president. So the question is who's running things. And I think it's going to take them a while uh, to figure out who's running things up there before they, we get a, a coherent response. I'm, I'm a little surprised they haven't tried to nationalize the National Guard. And I, the only reason I think they haven't done that is they're afraid the governors will block it or the state legislatures will block it and say, no, you're not going to nationalize our National Guard, which really would, I think, at that point prompt a, a genuine constitutional crisis. So I think at this point, uh, I think turning off the the stopping the natural gas terminals, I think was was part of part of what the federal government can do is kind of flex its economic muscles um, to do some things without without trying to 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 force a showdown because at this time, I don't think anybody knows what's going to happen if if a showdown really comes. Um, so i'm it, it's kind of wait and see. I agree with Jim that I don't think you know we're we're not on the verge of Texas, we're not on the verge of, of secession or anything like that. Uh, and I also agree with Jim that, you know, the, the constitutional, the idea that, that we're a constitutional republic, that's been dead in the water. Um, well, I mean, it, it's theoretically been dead since 1865, although we, it managed to, constitutionalism managed to limp, limp along for a while. Um, but then in the, in the mid-60s, of course, you had three big major pieces of legislation which pretty much ended the republic at that point. And we've been, we've been just living off fumes. And now, now the courts don't even pretend to follow the Constitution. They're, they're not, you know, the, the mask is totally off. So, um, yes, Texas can, can claim, you know, we're, we're, You've broken the compact. We're we're going to do this ourselves, but Washington's not going to buy that. Now the question is: is is Washington willing to to force a showdown, and does Abbott have the cojones to to meet the challenge? Mm -hmm. Is there a thought? Um, this is this is me thinking this. So there is a thought with me, and and I'm younger and maybe more naive and maybe more at least mentally bombastic on some of these issues. Part of me thinks, like you guys said, the Constitutional Republic's dead. They haven't been following the Constitution from the federal level in, 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 in my lifetime and, and probably y'all's. Cannot Texas just say, well, you don't follow the Constitution. We don't have to either. We're doing what we want. Well, in fact, that's what they're trying to do. They're mm -hmm. basically trying to make an argument uh, of self-help that if uh, one party to an agreement does not live up to its side of the agreement and I am entitled then to take measures uh, on my own to secure my interests since you refuse to perform according to the compact. Um, that, that essentially, by the way, was the argument that, that 1861, uh, that uh, I think I, I specifically remember South Carolina's declaration saying that we're two part, two part, two, uh, when you have an agreement between two or more parties, and one materially breaches the, uh, the, um, the, its obligations, and the other parties are likewise freed from their obligations if there's no arbitration mechanism provided. That makes perfect sense uh, if we were talking about the rule of law, which we're not. You know, I, th I think Clark is right. You know, the Constitution sort of limped along after 1861. Um, you know, unlike other countries where the, you know, 
theoretically, the current constitution, or our second constitution after the Articles of Confederation, and we've effectively had three constitutional systems under the, the facade of the current one. We had more or less the way it was written to be for about 80 or 90 years, and then for another 100 years or so. It's, you know, we had originally a confederal, confederal republic, and then for about 100 years, we had, about a, uh, we had a kind of a federal democracy, although under, under the cover of the same constitution, and then really growing through the world, uh, post-World War II period, and as Clark points out, with some really major shifts in the 1960s when things, even, even the facade of a federal democracy began to be replaced by uh, a consolidated administrative state run by essentially corporate interests and, uh, and, and a, lot, a lot of strings being pulled behind the scenes uh, that can't even pretend to be a democracy anymore, much less a constitutional republic. So, so there we have it. Um, yeah, you can make all the arguments you want, Buck, but the fact of the matter is they're not going to get you very far. It really then comes down to what, you know, I hate, <laughs> I hate to quote somebody uh, who's, Who's so weak on his democratic or republican credentials as Mao Zedong, but you know, political power comes from the barrel of a gun. Mm -hmm. And people are willing to face down the threat of violence and be willing to respond with it. And that's a horrible thing to contemplate. You know, a lot of people, you know, you'll see even on Twitter or X or whatever they call it now, you know, get this kind of, oh, you know, Civil War II, or actually it would be three if you count the revolution. Uh, and, um, Talk to some people who have been real civil wars, like mm -hmm. in Bosnia or in uh, Greece in the 1940s. There's no picnic. It's no picnic. And unfortunately, if it ever comes to that, it won't even be nice and neat with lines of armies in different colored uniforms like it was in 1861. It's going to be, it's going to look like Bosnia or Lebanon or someplace horrible like that. And I don't think, I don't, I don't know how many men, Americans are willing to contemplate what that really entails. Because uh, it, it, you know, once once you no longer have the rule of law, and that becomes apparent to people, and then when things start to fall apart, when things like supply chains and utilities and food at the grocery store and all that stuff starts to disappear on it, and people get kinetic about saving their lives, um, that's not anything to anticipate. Say, yeah, at least it'll lead to Texas. You know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that's not. You know, I, I, like I said, there's a rough road coming, and I, and you know, one of my big comforts at this stage is I'm, I'm pretty old. Guys, just want to tell you really quick, my friend Clark Carlton, guest on this show, friend of the show, a lot of people that are inquiring into orthodoxy or that are orthodox already, ask me to recommend them books. One of the best, absolute best books I've ever read concerning the orthodox faith is Clark Carlton's The Life, The Orthodox Doctrine of Salvation. He was on one of these episodes, just go search Clark Carlton Counterflow, you'll find it. We go over it. It's so good. It's so well put, concisely put, precisely put as well. It goes over the very obvious tenets of orthodoxy and the faith in heaven, hell, salvation, etc. It's back in print. See, when I had first interviewed him for the show, it was out of print. And there's a young Orthodox convert coming at my church, a catechumen. He said, do you have any books that you should recommend me? And I said, yes, immediately. I said, The Life by Clark Carlton. And I gave it to him. He devoured it quickly. It is back in print. Volume four of Clark Carlton's The Faith series is now back in print. The Life, The Orthodox Doctrine of Salvation presents the Orthodox Christian teaching on the most important question that anyone will ever face. What must one do to be saved? Go check it out. It's on Amazon.com. It's back in print. My friend, Clark Carlton, in his great book. Please check that out. Clark, you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, mean, I keep hearing on the internet people saying, well, this is, Texas is trying to nullify. I mean, technically, no, this isn't nullification uh, because they're not nullifying a federal law. The, the feds are the ones not, by, are not, not, not enforcing the laws on the books. Um, so it's not nullification, but in fact, we have had nullification in this country for the last 20 years because every mm -hmm. state that has legalized marijuana has done so uh, over uh, and against federal law, which has not changed. Uh, but clearly, and I think initially there was some attempt at the feds to try and stop this, but they literally 
didn't have the manpower to shut down all these, you know, marijuana shops and stuff, and they just couldn't do it. Um, so we we have had de facto uh, nullification on certain issues that, and I think at this point, I don't think that the federal government really even has the will um, to, to to roll roll that back. And so I think the the significant question is is will they have the will? Um, to overcome what Texas is doing. And I don't know, first of all, I don't know, I, I keep hearing about this one pass with the razor wire and stuff, but Texas has a long border and right. I don't know uh, if the whole thing is, I rather doubt the whole thing is uh, has been sealed. Um, and then of course you've got what, New Mexico and parts of California. So there's a lot of other places um, where this this massive influx can come in, and there do seem to be people in Washington who who are aiding and abetting this in the hopes of creating a uh, you know uh, a new a new electorate that will give uh, the Democratic Party a, a permanent supermajority. Um, and if 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 say you know Arizona or New Mexico, any of the other border states down there uh, wanted to do the same thing. Um, I think then we would really see something really interesting, a, a, a real battle of wills here. I think this looks bad for the federal government. It makes uh -huh. them look really weak. It makes Biden look weak. But again, he's non compass to begin with. So I think they, they already know he looks weak. Um, if this were really about, I mean, stopping the influx of illegal immigration across the entire southern border, I think they'd be much, much more aggressive in, in trying to push back than they have been so far. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. well, look, I mean, uh, I, 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 I'm glad you raised the point about the marijuana. Uh, it's, I don't know how much of that was that they didn't have the manpower or they just didn't care. They didn't feel that their vital interests were being threatened. Um, you know, there's another example that occurred to me as you were speaking as the sanctuary cities movement, sanctuary states movement that uh, under Trump, I mean, look, I wrote a piece at the time that uh, there were any numbers of federal statutes where those state and city officials could have been federally indicted uh, for felonies for basically harboring mm -hmm. fake fugitives, fugitives, illegal aliens and so forth. Right. You know, and if, if Trump had been in anything like control of the apparatus of the federal mm -hmm. government, when he was uh, president, uh, yeah, they they could have singled out several of those mayors and, and thrown them in irons and prosecuted them for decades in prison. I think that would have stopped the sanctuary movement pretty quickly. Um, maybe, because who knows what then, what the counter response would have been from the outraged people on the left who were, oh, fascism is coming to America because somebody's enforcing the law. So yeah, those mechanisms exist. But see, I would say that, that the apparatus of authority in Washington did not do that uh, for the same reason they didn't enforce the marijuana laws is that they did not think that that threatened their vital interests. Quite the contrary, it actually furthered them in some way. Do you think the feds really care about sanctuary cities? Of course they did not. Do they really care that Americans are dying from fentanyl or are all getting doped up on this drug or that drug? Of course they don't. But this is one that actually threatens the ruling regime in that if the if the state governments started actually enforcing the uh, the the laws of excuse me the, the borders of their states which in effect are also the borders of the United States and stop this influx and this uh this replacement of the American population with a new people uh yeah that does threaten the, the regime and uh they I don't think they will stand for that so yeah, you're right. If other states joined in this, and of course, New Mexico never will for partisan reasons. At the moment, Arizona will not. California is a lost cause. Oh yeah. So uh, it's um, you know I don't I don't I think te te Texas could be a tough nut for the, the the crack, but I don't think they're looking at a full scale revolt along the whole southern border, and that they can find a way to manage. I believe. Mm -hmm. Well, y'all both answered basically what I was going to ask. I was looking at this in two separate uh, sections. The immigration thing, got it. But this this stand that the state government's taking against the federal regime, 
uh, maybe I should not be separating those two because in this instance, it's going down specifically because one equals the other. Is that what you see? Like this is really is about the immigration, not necessarily just the rule of law versus, uh, you know, rebellion. Well, I, I think I'm hearing numbers like something like 10, 12 million uh, uh, illegal, uh, people who crossed over illegally. That's the numbers I'm hearing. Then I've heard some estimates even much higher than that. I mean, in many places, and I'm in Tennessee, so you know we're not hardly on the front lines of any of this stuff. But in a lot of places, this is becoming an existential crisis. And I think that's probably why Abbott found his, uh, you know, his spine was because this is a, a, an existential crisis uh, for them, and they've got to do something. And so this has kind of forced them in a position which I, I don't I don't think any of these people are natural heroes. Um, uh, I, I think that the circumstances ha have put themselves put them in these circumstances, and so far Abbott ha and you know his his. Uh, um, Attorney General Paxton. I mean, you know, they 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 seem to be, you know, standing up. And again, DeSantis was was pretty good on COVID, and and uh, now that he's not running for president, he seems to have, um, you know, sort of woken woken up. Um, so I think I think the situation is unique. I don't think they would have dared pick this fight over something that wasn't uh, yeah. an existential problem for yeah. for their states and and for their communities. Um, whether they continue, whether they, whether they continue, that's another another issue. Mm -hmm. Jim, yeah, I I think that's right. I I think applying the word existential here is important because at some point we get past the kind of the pro forma discussion of the federalism and the states this and the feds that and the other thing, and it comes down to the question of people, uh, and that when it really starts to hurt the people of this country, the people this. The, the states and threaten their well-being, their livelihood, their lives, uh, that somebody somewhere is going to have to do something or, or, or quite to the contrary, they just submit, they just accept the destruction of their communities and their lives. And that's what the path that we fall down in the future in this country. And I think that's one reason why I do get a little frustrated sometimes, you know, look, I'm not going to lie. I'm a Trump supporter. I hope he wins in November. I think it's very highly unlikely that he will. But and I and, and even if he did, by the way, I don't think much good is going to happen after that. I think we'll see the same kind of chaos we saw during his first term uh, on steroids. But that's the, that's a whole other another story. But I think one of the great distractions that we have in, in what's left of America today is this notion that it's all about you know restore the Constitution, restore the rule of law. You know that somehow we can put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Rather than say, you know what, been there, done that, uh, America is not the same as its constitution. Um, a country has a constitution. A current country isn't a constitution. And uh, and as long as people are focused on uh, what amounts to a piece of paper that's worthless, unless it reflects the values and interests of the people it represents, and as you know, when I was a kid in civic school, which was you know civic class a long time ago, they gave us this stuff about. We we have a a, a, a the country a, a rule a, what is it um, the rule of law not of men. Well, you mm -hmm. know what, there is no rule of law without men. Men must implement the law as it's written and have the integrity and the values that are reflected in the document. Once that's gone, then you have to go to what's below that, which is the people themselves. Is there enough social cohesion among what you know? What I like to call the American ethnos, you know, the founding ethnos, you know, uh, which you guys are probably related to by blood, but I am not. You know, those those guys who spoke English with the, you know, the, 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 the you know, the, the knee breeches and the powdered wigs and all that stuff reflecting their English heritage and all that to concoct a constitution that embodied their values and their way of life and that they hoped would be perpetuated. Uh, does that ethno still exist? Is it still a functional nation anymore? Uh, I, well, I see Clark shaking his head. I'm many more optimistic than he is that there's still <laughs> something left of that there. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure. I guess we'll find out. I think one of the great distractions is so many people still think it's about the Constitution rather than about the people who created the Constitution that the Constitution was meant to serve. 
Interesting. I I want you guys both mentioned, I think, Texit. Is that, well, for one, it's something I've been at least interested in for, for 20 years or something, but uh, it does seem like it's entering a popular discussion. If, if, at least if you go on Twitter, which is kind of what I use for the for an example of the town hall for lack of you know better term, but it's something that I felt, let's say in the late nineties, like I was in a fringe group discussing this this these ideas. And now I've seen mainstream reporters, you know, kind of mocking it, of course, but it's it's something that mainstream people are talking about. Do you guys hear about this from where y'all are at? I don't. Um, well, a, a little bit, but then again, I hang out with, um, you know, Abbeville people. And so, <laughs> um, of course, it, <laughs> secession is like our mother's milk. Um, and, 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 you know, the country's too big. Jefferson thought the country ought to break up into five or six regional republics. Um, and, uh, he was right. Um, in the, the best possible of all worlds, we would break up peacefully and, and, and shake hands and, 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 and uh, break up peacefully, but that's not going to happen. Um, I think the people who ought to be, in theory, supporting that, the Stars and Stripes still has tremendous emotional power and pull on people. Mm -hmm. And... Southerners to this day are still the most likely people to join the military. Now, that's gone down quite a bit. And I understand, you know, especially since post-COVID, that there's, there's been a huge drop in, in you know, lineal uh, military families, uh, you know, keeping up that tradition. But I, there's still that strong emotional pull. And, and still a strong emotional attachment to the Constitution, even though most Americans don't know what's in it. Most Americans couldn't tell the Declaration from the Constitution and have absolutely no idea what any of it says. But, but it's, it's like the Bible. You know, we have this reverence for something, you know, people have never read. Uh, but but it's, it's nice to know it's out there somewhere. <laughs> and that we have this intense uh, emotional pull of the stars and stripes and, you know, this kind of patriotism. And when you start pointing the finger and accusing somebody of being unpatriotic, that's still rhetorically a powerful uh, uh, cannon to aim at somebody, even if the person who's aiming it uh, is um, one of the squad. <laughs> you know? Right, right. And, and, and it, it's, so, so no, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any change. Remember at, at the, the meeting in Tobaccoville, we had some... Um, self-described monarchists mm -hmm. and all the panelists were like <laughs> good god we're not going to have a monarchy you just stop just no, get over not. it we're not going to have a <laughs> and i don't think we're going to have texit or 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 secession or anything like that um but then again the question is whether or not the center in, in of this administrative state and hold because right. you indicated in your, your intro, there's a hell of a lot of, of incompetence there. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's kind of kind of a race between, you know, what, what's going to break first? The, 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 the backbone of the, you know, the, the governors or the, the competency crisis in, in D.C. And, and, and throughout Leviathan because Leviathan is it's not so much a scary sea monster. It's almost a comical. It's more like uh, the name. Uh, it was Sigmund the Sea Monster from, from, from my youth uh, on, uh, on Saturday morning TV. It's, it's, it's Leviathan. It's, it's power is it, it, still scary, but the people who are running it are, are, are risible. And, you know, I think, yeah. I think that's politically, that's where the interesting stuff's going to see how that plays out. Yes. Yeah. Re re release the Kraken. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, you know, I, when, when you saw the map of the governors that supported Abbott, and you look at where the states were, it looks almost like the uh, the Panhandle of Texas went up to the Dakotas. You know, we yes. have greater Texas in kind of the middle of the country, and you know, I, I look, I I think there would be a very natural way for this country to break up if it were to break up, which is essentially a a, a woke northeastern 
uh, republic and some kind of a woke thing along the West Coast and then uh, some uh, based thing all in the space in between. And that's a pretty good start, you know? I mean, that, but here's the problem, of course. You, you want Texas. You want to take Austin with you or you want to leave that <laughs> with somebody else? Uh, it's, the trouble is, is that the real divisions in this country are less uh, w- between states as they right. were in 1861 yeah. and more uh, within states, especially urban versus rural. You know, as I like to say, in 1861, they, they read the same Bible. They honored the same, they prayed to the same God. They honored the same constitution, claimed fidelity to the same founding fathers. We don't even agree on what our pronouns are or what a woman is. We just don't belong in the same country together anymore, but there's no way to get from A to B. Uh, and uh, this is the problem. Now, one thing that could force, if you will, the the crack to happen on the regime side before they can, before something else cracks, is that, um, you know, you're probably familiar with that quotation from a letter from Robert E. Lee, I think the Lord Acton after the war, when he said that consolidated union would be sure to be tyrannical at home and aggressive abroad. Mm-hmm. Well, that certainly happened. And I think there's an uh, uh, indissoluble link, not between the states necessarily, but between the uh, consolidated administrative regime in Washington and uh, our, uh, our the global American empire, or the gay as we call it, mm-hmm. that that the, uh, the drive of Washington and its satellites to impose the very same kind of rainbow values on America is also one that we are driving to impose on the rest of the world. And if you've checked on it lately, they ain't, they ain't going so well. You're right. They ain't going well in Ukraine. They ain't going well in the Middle East. I don't think it'll go well in the Far East. And I believe that what is really going to accelerate this process is as that as that uh, global agenda crashes and it's crashing before our eyes, mm-hmm. just as the breakup of the Warsaw Pact and the World Communist Movement sent a shockwave back that swept away the regime in Moscow, the red mm-hmm. regime in Moscow, I think this is going to have a big impact on what happens here in the United States, that the the credibility, the power projection, all of these things are inextricably tied up with empire. Once that empire collapses and this these these midget emperors have no more clothes that will be apparent domestically as well and also a lot of things that are, that are related to that like uh, the fact that you know walmart and target are full of all sorts of cheap stuff from abroad that we don't have it from our manufacturing base anymore but we can purchase at far less than their value because we have the privilege of dollar seniorage around the world once we don't have that anymore mm-hmm. and people can't buy that stuff so easily and the standard of living crashes from that that's going to accelerate the process as well. Again, I'm not favoring this. I'm not happy at, at, at the, this prospect, but I don't think it's avoidable. Mm-hmm. Is I'm mean, just I'm just wondering the, the the degree to which the the Hamas mess is 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 going to to cause major unravels because you're seeing major fissures in, in within the left. Yes, you know. So you've got the the anti-Zionist pro pro Palestinian and and then you know the pro-Israeli and and of course the the left has had always had such an important uh, significant element of uh, you know pro-Israel. Uh, I mean, I think this is that that's I don't I didn't see that coming as wild as it, coming in as it is. And look, look what's going on at Harvard. I mean. Harvard is, you're getting a civil war going on within Harvard, which is ideologically, uh, somebody said one time Catherine Hepburn had the emotional range of of A to B, and that's pretty much what what Harvard's uh, uh, ideological range is, and yet they're having a civil war up there. Well, you're right, and and, you know, I mean, both parties uh, are about as dysfunctional as the regime they represent. Yeah. Uh, and, and and their donors, of course, not, not the people who whom they pretend to represent. But uh, look, you, the Democratic Party, you've got you know, a huge element of uh, Jewish money. I mean, you know, most Jews are very liberal. They do- donate money to the Democratic Party. But then you've got this, like you say, the squad, this Afro-Asian, Islamic, third world kind of mentality. And by the way, there are an awful lot of young Jews as well as a lot of young people across the board mm-hmm. that sympathize more with the, you might say, the Antifa wing and the BLM wing. 
of the Democratic Party than they do with the old-fashioned, you know, liberals that were generally pro-Israel. Then on the Republican side, you've got all these, I hate to try to think of a nice way to say looney tunes, uh, people in office demanding war with Iran and yeah. unfortunately representing a lot of their evangelical Christian dispensationalist base <laughs> yes. that, you know, thinks that, you know, God literally stands by anything Bibi and Netanyahu gets into his his brain on any given day. So, I mean, how do you run a country like this? It's just, it's just, it's just crazy. Well, the fishers everywhere. I'm just reading uh, this week that uh, apparently uh, Lou Rockwell and Hans Hermann Hoppe have excommunicated Walter Block yes. from the yes. from the the Church of Libertarianism <laughs> over true. his Zionism. Yes, that just came out a couple of days ago, and. You guys are so good at this without realizing you were walking me into what I wanted to ask. And I, and I think now I've got the answer. But just to clarify, it's this, it's something I didn't question or, or even think about until I became Orthodox, basically, and started paying attention to certain things, noticing more things, if you will. Is this Republican right, not, I, I say right wing very, very, very loosely, this conservative Republican love for Israel basically rooted in like John Nelson Darby or something like this without them maybe knowing it? I think, yeah, a lot of it, a lot of it because there's such a strong, you know, evangelical background, as you know, perfectly well, uh, Buck, from here. Yes. <laughs> you're on. But yeah, a, a lot of it is, is because <laughs> of this evangelical, but a lot of it's money. Right. I'll say they just don't have any money. Uh, unless, you know, the Arabs are, are funneling, funneling it to them, but, you know, they don't have any money of their own. And so a lot of it's money. A lot of it is this this evangelical because they know their evangelical voter base um, uh, supports this. And, you know, it, it is kind of knee-jerk. Um, it's so powerful, and it's rooted in, to use a modern term, misinformation and it's i it's something i can't fathom and i can't understand why it's so widespread and i, I know that sounds naive it's like i i get how propaganda works but it's just hard to it's hard to believe that books like clark's are sitting out there available for anyone on the planet to read and and a mass movement a, a heavy-handed political movement in, in this country supports israel on, on the basis well, of something faulty. Well, you know, I'm not a big fan of Abe Lincoln, but when he said uh, it's not what they don't know that's the problem, it's what they know that just ain't so, uh, that's the problem. Uh, yes. he, he, had, he was right about that. I mean, uh, there are a lot of people, since they're not grounded, not even grounded in the scriptures, but not even grounded in the tradition of the church and, and the understanding of, you know, what is the relationship between you know, it, it, you know, with Christianity and Judaism and the the tradition of the the rabbis and all that stuff, and you know, what is who is Israel? All that stuff we talked about last time, Buck, mm -hmm. is that uh, once something becomes firmly established as what everybody knows to be true, what do you do with that? You know, it's I I, I don't really I don't see any way out of that easily. And by the way, this gets us back to where we were talking about Texas and the rest of that. Uh, as you know, what we're talking about right now is very firmly believed by an awful lot of people down there in Texas, a lot of good-hearted Christian people who probably would be, you know, first on the border to try to defend it and also would be ready to stand up for an independent Texas and are against all the woke rainbow nonsense coming mm -hmm. from Washington, et cetera, et cetera. But on the other hand, they they believe this other stuff, book, a line, and sinker. I know. So it's not a real neat thing where you've got some people who have got their right. heads screwed on straight about everything and a, a bunch of other people who are wrong about everything. It's all kind of mixed up together. Yes, and uh, you know, unfortunately, politics and is as messy as, as as the human mind is, which often is quite messy indeed. Yeah, yeah. Philosophers like for everything to be you know coherent and and straightforward. But but to use a, a favorite term of my sociologist friends, we have a tremendous capacity for cognitive dissonance. We 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 just hold together lots of things that don't go, and. Paul Gottfried has talked about the fact that there there really isn't a a, a, a right wing tradition in this country, not in the European mm -hmm. sense. He, mm -hmm. He's pointed out that the Southern Presbyterians, like uh, Dabney, were probably the closest thing we've ever had to it to a European right in this country. We're all liberals of just a, of of some some degree or another. And if you're you know if you're a Southern agrarian, 
um, then you're you know you're a Jeffersonian liberal. Uh, if if you're in New York, you're a Hamil- you're a Hamiltonian liberal, which is a quite quite different kind kinds of things. And then of course we got libertarians, and and they can't make up their minds what they're doing. So th- there <laughs> there isn't th- there is no one party. There is no one single coherent thought that people can say, okay, I can join this and and have this I- entirely coherent worldview that we can live out. And you you. You're part of this. You 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 know hold your nose and vote Republican, or in some cases even hold your nose and vote Democrat, maybe. But we, you know, so, so often we're we're holding our nose in the in the voting booth, um, and it's it's a matter of choosing the lesser of several evils, and and just trying to navigate one crisis, one crisis at a time. But there's no there's no overarching program. There's no co- coherent philosophy that I, that I can see that anybody uh, seems to follow. Is, is the regime in y'all's minds as weak as you've seen it in your lifetime? Uh, I think it is, uh, as, but it's, let's not get too optimistic about that either. As my mm-hmm. late friend Samuel Francis used to say, I mean, he was the originator of the term anarcho-tyranny, yes. I believe, is that... Um, they will, you know, again, back to the border, any number of things, uh, if it's, if it's counter social, if it's destructive, if it's actual criminality, uh, the government shows a, a remarkable degree of passivity and weakness in dealing with it. If they're dealing with people that they know are respectful of authority are inclined to do the right thing are law abiding people and, 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 and are easily intimidated. If you if accuse them of doing something wrong, they will come down on you like a ton of bricks. Yes, and uh, and they will be dragged. I mean, get G six. I mean, do you have to say any more compared to the to the BLM riots? Right. So yeah, it is it, it is weak. Uh, you know, somebody once said about Russia that Russia is never as strong as it appears or as weak as it appears. Uh, that's true of the regime right now. It is both very very strong and very very weak at the same time, depending on what we're talking about. Mm. Clark. Yeah, I, I I would agree with that, and and I think the the, the border episode is is a classic example of a narco tyranny, uh, because the, the federal government is not enforcing the rules, and then I wasn't even paying attention to whatever the Senate resolution they were talking about last week. You don't need a Senate revolution a resolution. You've got right. You don't need to do anything. Just enforce the laws that are actually there. Um, but that's that's of course what they're not going to do. But if you you have internet memes, you can be sentenced to uh, uh, to, to, to jail over internet memes. Uh, it's it it's just bizarre. Now, on the one hand, that seems to me to be not the sign of a powerful, coherent central government. I, d- I don't think strong governments don't need to rule by a narco. Tyranny. So I think that's that's a sign of weakness, but that doesn't mean the thing's going to collapse at, at any point. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, the, the American empire is going to collapse at any point. Now, if an aircraft carrier gets sunk in the in the uh, <laughs> the Gulf of Aden or somewhere, <laughs> then uh, if people sense blood in the water. You know, it, it could collapse all of a, all of a sudden. I don't think we're on the verge of any kind of collapse. But if if something you know catastrophic were to happen, you know, things could could unravel very very quickly. At, at the yeah, moment, it looks like we're gonna we're just gonna whimper, mm-hmm. die with a whimper. But <laughs> uh, you know, I think things could go south very very quickly given the right circumstances. Yeah, I think that's one of the problems with the past is prologuing. You look, you, you look at their capacities a muddle along, and they do, but then there's the the sort of things look good for the turkey until Thanksgiving Day comes, and then suddenly they don't. The past is no longer a prologue. Um, you know, I think one of the evidences of that is their absolute paranoia over Donald Trump. I mean, yes, I, I don't like I said, even if he does get elected, I don't think he's going to be able to do very much, and that we're beyond trying to save the. The pretense of the system that he's still, you know, e- e- evoking civic nationalism of a sort. But uh, the reason they hate him so much is they instinctively understand that he's kind of an avatar for this um, American, you know, ethnos, narod, folk, whatever you want to call it, 
all those people out there and all those deplorable and fly, plor, deplorables in flyover country who still think and, and their guts are still the kind of legacy Americans that we always understood this country be, to be uh, made up of. And that terrifies them because they thought that that was good and truly laid in its grave when, you know, we had the election in 2016 and Hillary would come into her kingdom and uh, mm -hmm. there would be no longer any prospect for reviving that. When Trump says, it's not me they're after, it's you. They have to get through me to come to you. Yeah, there's a lot of truth to that. It's it, the, the, the war of, again, I don't, the word woke is overused, but the war of coming from that direction is directed against what's left of an American people uh, that uh, that Trump is kind of this visual symbol of. And that's why they, I think, uh, on a gut level, they're absolutely paranoid about him. And not that, you know, he's really going to be the orange Hitler if he gets into office any more than he's going to be the orange savior, savior if he gets mm -hmm. into office. Mm -hmm. Well, what was it? So, so was it a state senator out in California or one of those Western states that had said that Trump has a plan to, to put alligators in the moats? Yes. To, to eat? Yeah, if only. The, 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 the level is just, it, you know, and, and again, that, that's a sign of weakness that you have people in <laughs> positions of power who are psychotic. I mean, and not even psychotic in a competent way. Um, so, I mean, what's was the Chinese uh, threat? May you live in interesting times. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Wait, let's hold on here a second now. It's pretty warm down there on the Rio Grande, right? Uh, and I believe that alligators are not native to that area, but could they be introduced? I mean, that's a... Uh, we got in Louisiana, so... Yeah, yeah exactly. sure, exactly. I mean, let's, yes. let's not be hasty and... and, and uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what an interesting person that came on the scene that I it took me longer than it should have to, to pay a little bit of attention to him. I want to get y'all's opinions on uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. Um, I, I was of the opinion during the debates that the, the, the debate should be limited only to people of Indian origin. Just R Vivek and, uh, and, uh, and Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley should yeah. be the only ones allowed to participate in the, in the debates. Um, I don't know what to make of him. I've talked to some Indian Americans who do not think highly of him and think he's a he's, there's something contrived about him that there's a, there's there, there's there's something fishy about him. What I've seen him say. I've generally been fairly positive of. I mean, uh, you know, it's uh, he seems to make have a lot of common sense with what what he's saying. Um, he, he he did say some kind of dumb stuff about how we could end the war in Ukraine. We'll just tell the Russians that they have to do this, that, and the other thing, and they'll they'll take that deal. And you know, it, it struck me as at best naive. But um, you know, compared, I guess the guy, the answer is compared to whom? Mm -hmm. Compared to Nikki Haley? Yeah, I think Vivek in a, in a heartbeat. Um, but um, then again, there are very few people I would not take over uh, over Nikki Haley. Clark? Um, I really don't have an opinion. I mean, he says a lot of the right things, but I don't really know how to how to read the fellow. Um, I, I have an inherent distrust of, of most of these politicians, and I kind of assume that they're they're BSing, uh, that they're they're putting on a show. Um so whether he's sincere or whether he's just putting on a show, uh, I don't know. He certainly doesn't excite me. Okay. Do you, are y'all, I, this is, would be insulting to ask if you're familiar with it. Y'all are both much more brilliant than I am. What are your thoughts on the circulation of the elites Pareto's, uh, theory on that? Did I stump you, Jim Jatris? <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't know. What do you say? Circulation. Of, of the elites, what do you mean, like the revolving door or something Correct. like that? Or yeah, you know, I mean that that they're all the same people, basically, whether they're or, in government. Or that once some, I'm, where I was going with this yeah. is that if we are in a weak moment for the regime and these elites start to crumble and fall, is there a counter elite forming with people like Musk? Let's say, for example, Tucker Carlson and people uh, almost like uh, Peter Thiel rich, powerful people in the backgrounds, uh, background who are ready to circulate upward as the current elites fall? Um, I, I wouldn't bet on it. 
I mean, generally, a revolutionary situations occur and not when one group of elites is replaced by another, but rather when there's a split in the ruling establishment. You know, when, for example, in France, when the third estate declares itself to be the National mm. Assembly of France, or during the Bolshevik Revolution, when the Petrograd Soviet, which had been in alliance with the provisional government, then declares itself to be the new government in stages of coup. Uh, even if you look at it within the way the, the various um, uh, re revolutions occurred in the early 1990s of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact countries, those were splits within the communist regime that precipitated okay. the crisis. So what you'd have to really look for is not so much alternative elites that are sort of bubbling around somewhere, in my opinion, but rather who within the ruling establishment is uh, getting really upset with the way things are going, think that their power and privileges are going to go down the toilet and decide that somehow they need to break from the established pattern and create what they call the second pivot, a second um, a, a, a point of authority. I mean, by the way, you could say the same thing in our, in our revolution, uh, that you had the crown and then you had the Continental Congress arising as an alternative to the crown, but arising from the same the same structure of, of government. Um, you could even say again about the, the, the Civil War. You had state governments that said, we're now a, a separate government, but they had been part of the same ruling mm -hmm. establishment mm -hmm. under, under the, uh, the Constitution. So, you know, do you look at, at, you know, Elon Musk and Tucker Carlson as parts of the ruling establishment that would be splitting from the rest of the establishment? I'm not sure. So uh, I'm not sure right. that's a viable path. Okay. Clark? Yeah. Uh, uh, revolutions, uh, successful revolutions, almost never come from the bottom up. They come when, when, when people, especially right. in, the, mm -hmm. in the ruling class, can get enough of people in the middle. They feel their, their interests threaten. Uh, as, as Jim said, that's what, look, the, the American Revolution, these people were all planters and, and businessmen. Mm -hmm. And this wasn't, this wasn't some peasant revolt going on right. here. Right. Uh, and again, Elon Musk, I mean, he's done a lot of good things, but, you know, I'm sure if we sat down and, and went through his entire, you know, life philosophy, I would disagree with 80% of it. The fact that, you know, he irritates some of the right people is, is entertaining. Um, you know, I don't know Tucker Carlson. I, I hope he's sincere, but, you know, I, I almost don't trust anybody, you know, in the, in the professional media because we've been burned so many times uh with with you know hitch, hitching our our our, our star to people and and the people who are truly consistent and have a consistent vision are are unelectable i mean ron paul is one of the most i think honorable people we've had in american politics since well i don't know when maybe dan patrick moynihan maybe i don't know Pat uh, Buchanan. Uh, yes. Pat, yeah, yeah, Pat yeah, Buchanan, you yeah but but, you know, Ron Paul wasn't, you know, your Stephanopoulos laughed in his face on, on national television. You know, the, 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 we, he, there was no chance of, of Ron Paul ever getting elected precisely because he's honorable and, and you know, philosophically consistent. Um, I think to get, a, to, to get along in politics, to get along in government, you have to be philosophically nimble. Uh, and you, you have to know how to, to, to you know, tune your message. And... Uh, so I don't know what what happens if 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 is this going to be replaced by a new elite? I don't think so because they have had the left has had full spectrum control over the levers of of uh, education and and culture production in this country for for twenty or thirty years. Mm -hmm. At least, so yeah. you know where, where is this elite going to kill? Uh, you know, Hillsdale? Nah, <laughs> no, it's no, not it's not going. The, the new elite isn't coming from Hillsdale. And I'm not at Aquinas College or anything. They, they, these are, you know, fine institutions, I'm sure. But Harvard still has a stranglehold. Um, the Ivies still have a stranglehold on, on cultural production and on the production of elites in this country. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, you do have examples in history where uh, an elite was largely replaced, even if the split had originally occurred during the within the ruling class, like, for example, the Bolshevik Revolution or the Great French Revolution, which then exterminated well, the yeah, previous... Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then you do have a new elite <laughs> stepping forward. But, uh, 
you know, that's that's a little bit down the road to to, to envision. And again, that would not be a pretty prospect. Mm -hmm. Is there any optimism you guys have for, let's say, the coming next couple of years? <laughs> Clark, you go first. <laughs> Jim's got to think on this one. Optimism? I don't know. Um, I, I will say that that the battle of the Texas border is is um, has raised my spirits a little bit. I don't know how optimistic I am, but it, it has raised my spirits a little bit as opposed to seeing everything as bleakness. Um, kind of following up what Jim just said a minute ago, I, I don't think we're in nearly as bad a shape as England is. Because I don't, I, don't I don't think England has anybody in, 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 uh, th that it is even remotely capable of turning, turning that country uh, around the, the parliament. The, the, the Tory party is, is just, if, if anything, worse than the Republican Party, oh. which, is, which is scandalous. But, but so um, I, I would say this. Uh, what, what, wasn't it Jim Tip O'Neill has said all politics is local? I think you you have to just start at the local, and maybe if if people can can make an impact at at the at the grassroots level, that's the only way to create a bench. I think, um, you know, the, the local politics is is the minor leagues, and that's the only way to replace uh, the major leaguers is is by training people in the minor leagues, and and so maybe if we can have spots of of local sanity, maybe 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 a new leadership can arise out of that. Yeah, I, I, I tend to disagree. Um, I, I, I'm optimistic, but perhaps for a different reason. I don't think anything can come up through the, the system, so to speak, through no. any kind of organizing, getting elites who can get elected to office or Republican Party, for crying out loud. <laughs> uh, it's, but rather, um, I think, again, it gets down to something more elemental, which is at the level of the people and the, the degree to which the people have some degree of consciousness about who they are and about what their values and interests are. Um, you know, in a way, I'm even more optimistic, not to mention England, but other countries in Europe than I am about the United States. If you look at Eastern Europe, of course, you know, people there still know, you know, Russians still know their Russians, Hungarians still know their Hungarians, Poles still know their Poles. I think there's still a fair number of people who know that they're Germans, Frenchmen, Englishmen. I don't know how many Americans still know what an American mm. is other than, mm. oh, my constitution, which is not, or I'm a Christian. I mean, that's not going to do it. You know, that, <laughs> that is not a, a nation. And uh, so maybe once everything collapses, and I think some the collapse is going to be more profound than anything we've seen in our lifetimes, maybe even more, more profound during the Great Depression or even the, the last Civil War. Um, yes, yeah, something could rise to the top if there are enough people with the degree of consciousness to pull something together almost from scratch, starting, as Clark said, from the local level. But I don't think it'll be coming through, you know, the local Republican committee or anything like that. Um, right. But I, I do think that, um, that, that as, as I think that kind of collapse is pretty much baked into the cake. Yeah, I think something could arise, but it's not it's not a surefire thing. We could just sort of fade away as, uh, as what's left of what once was a people, and, um, and that'll be that. <laughs> All right, uh, I we'll close this up. I want both of you to plug anything you'd like. And Clark, we we've mentioned your book. You can go over that again. Plug whatever you'd like. Well, I've already plugged it once. So. All right, and we can find it on Amazon. And it's <laughs> technically been plugged again because at some point within this, my producer has inserted that ad for it. Oh, okay. And well, I, again, I can't recommend it highly enough to people listening. Jim, do you have anything of the other? No, no. The, as I said, I, I hope I have my book out uh, by the middle of this year. And um, and other than following me on X Twitter, whatever it's called, at Jim Jatris, um, that's it. That's that's who I am. Got it. Wonderful, gentlemen. Clark Carlton, Jim Jatris. Thank you so much for joining us here on Counterflow. What did you think of that? Were they more skeptical than you are about this secession movement? This is going to be an interesting time. This is going to be an interesting year as we've already kind of discussed what may be to come in 2024 and past episodes. So uh, yeah, this is going to be good next week. And I should tell you guys, I dropped a hint 
at the end of last week's episode, hinting at my guest next week. You know, I, I had him all booked and then this Texas stuff was bubbling up so quickly. I wanted to cover that. So back to the hints for next week's guest, which I dropped last week. I'll just go ahead and tell you who it is. My friend and friend of the show, Charles Haywood is back. That's a very, very good discussion. And uh, until, well, let's see, I, I should do all my plugs, right? Counterflowpodcast.com. Follow me on Twitter at Buck Rebel, B-U-C-K-R-E-B-E-L. Patreon.com slash Counterflow is the Zoom club that we do once a month. Again, that's Patreon.com slash Counterflow for $5 a month when you sign up there or more if you'd like. It's up to you, but the minimum is $5. You get an official invite to our monthly Zoom sessions. And not to worry, friends, we've got one. I've got some, some people in my mind right now that I need to schedule for our monthly Zoom session for February. We're going to do that. It's never recorded. It's never posted. It's just a private meeting between my Patreon donors and a special guest and me. It's a very, very good time. I highly recommend doing that, not just because it helps me with the production of this show, but I genuinely love doing that. The time that we spend together each month is very valuable to me outside of the financial aspect of it. And until next week, you guys have a good one. You get split in half, cause I call the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash your sinus with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Counterflow podcast? Our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.